Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sophie. I'm a librarian at Wyndham City Libraries. I'm joined by my colleagues Kirsty and Sharon. Uh, who will be helping you this evening uh, throughout the event. I'd like to begin by doing an acknowledgement of country. Wyndham City Council recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first custodians of the land on which Australia was founded. Council acknowledges the Wathaurong, Wirrung and Woonwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the lands on which Wyndham City is being built. Council pays respect to the wisdom and diversity of past and present elders. We share commitment to nurturing future generations of elders in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Now, before we get stuck in, I'll just go through some housekeeping. Uh, so please note there'll be a 10 to 60 second lag in the video. So what you see on your screen will be slightly behind what's happening on our end. Um, you might also see a delay when we're changing the on-screen content, but don't worry, that's normal. Um, you'll see the new content pop up. We've also allocated a 15 minute Q&A um, at the end of the session. Um, so if you have questions that come up as we go along, please feel free um, to post them in the chat and you should be able to see a speech bubble on the right uh, top right hand side of your screen and that's where you can ask questions. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please post your questions here and Kirsty, Sharon and I will assist you. Um, your questions and comments will remain private unless we share them with the group. OK, so it's with great pleasure uh, that I welcome and introduce our guests this evening, uh, Jesse Ferrari and Dr. Duane Hamaka. Jesse is a Yorta Yorta person and a fourth year undergraduate student pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Ecology, specialising in genetics at the University of Melbourne. Jesse is one of the five recipients of the Agilent Indigenous STEM Leadership Award, which recognises the leadership actions taken in STEM by Indigenous students pursuing science. Dr. Duane Hamaka is Associate Professor of Cultural Astronomy in the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne and a member of the Astro 3D Centre of Excellence. Duane has researched meteorotic phenomena in a scientific and cultural context extensively for 15 years. So welcome Duane and Jesse, thank you again for joining us. I'm now going to hand over to Jesse, who's going to tell us all about uh, Koori Astronomy. So give us a moment and I'll put her in the feed. Awesome, thank you so much for that um, introduction, Sophie. That was brilliant, that was so lovely. Um, I'm just gonna get the my presentation up so everyone can look at the amazing slide that I've got prepared for tonight's talk. So just bear with me a bit, it shouldn't take too long. Um, Okay, can everyone see the slides all right? Yep, they will in a minute. <laughs> okay, um, so Te, um, which is Yoda Yoda Fel Hello everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a lovely night and thank you so much for joining myself and Dwayne on our talk about Indigenous astronomy and ecology. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm so happy that I'm talking to you all on Science Week. Um, and I'm give and talk a bit about my background um, and also kind of like how my knowledge as an Indigenous person meets my knowledge in my degree as an ecologist. Um, so like uh, Sophie said, I'm a Yorta Yorta person and I'm currently pursuing a degree in ecology, um, in particular ethnic eco um, ethnoecology, and I study at the University of Melbourne. I'm joined today by my co-host, um, also my mentor, the amazing Drain Hamacher, or Hamacher, sorry, <laughs> um, who's the Associate Professor of Cultural Astronomy at the University of Melbourne, um, and who is just a, a force to be reckoned with, like an amazing person to definitely talk to if you want to know more about Indigenous um, astronomy. Okay, so I would like to start, before I begin this session, um, I wanted to acknowledge the, the current lands that I'm on. So I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, I pay my respects past, present and emerging to the elders. Also like to extend my respects to 
all of the elders and the, the nations that you're all streaming in on tonight. Um, sovereignty of this land was never ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, so what I've got here is the map of Australia and as you can see that it's quite a diverse place. So we have many, many language groups, many, many nations, many, many clan groups. Um, and I think this is a wonderful, wonderful thing to start the session with because I think it's important that we understand that Indigenous culture is diverse, Indigenous people are diverse. We're not a homogenous group and our culture is not a monolith. And on my portion of the talk, I will be focusing on these particular nations. Um, these are Kura nations of Victoria. So the Kulin, so particularly the Kulin nations, so the um, Wadarong, the Tongarong, the Bunmurong, the Rundri, and the Jaja Wurrung. I'll also be talking a bit about um, knowledges in the Wagai nation, especially the Burung people. And I'll be talking a bit about um, Gamilaroi knowledges. And Dwayne will be talking about Torres Strait, talking a bit about Indigenous um, Torres Strait Island astronomy, which is just up here. Unfortunately, the islands, you can't really see them, but just up here, like the north of, far, far north of Queensland. So Indigenous culture, uh, our knowledge systems were passed down through oral traditions, were passed down through dance, song, um, storylines, and we, it focuses heavily on social practices, um, craftsmanship, so that the, and the physical world around us, but also the sky. Um, we use the land around us to, uh, in which uh, we use the land around us to um, give us reminders about sacred law, but also cultural stories. Um, and of course, my perspective of this is coming from a Koori person of uh, the Yorta Yorta Nation. So my my experiences, my lived experiences, also my knowledge is vastly different to um, Indigenous people from other parts of so-called Australia. So I want to just kind of stress that. So my, yeah, my experience is quite different. Um, and like I was saying, yep, so, um, knowledge is, in my experience, like in, with my people, we have um, every, a few very sacred songs and dances that tell us about how to take care of country. Um, um, it, these songs range from things like, um, so Dreamtime stories, so how we were created, um, and also just how we need to uphold our sacred obligations to our creator and to earth in, in order to care for country. Um, and moving on, I'd like to talk a bit about the Western versus the Indigenous view of the world, of the environment in particular, um, and, and of science. And unfortunately, there is a misconception that Indigenous knowledge systems are not scientific. Um, I think that's completely incorrect. I think um, Indigenous knowledge has a lot to offer to science, and I don't think it should be compared to Western science. I think it, it is valid in its own right. Um, so with indigenous knowledge, as you can see, like in the, the picture here, everything is interconnected. It's holistic. Um, when one system is out of whack, everything else is going to be affected. And it's very important that we, I stress this point because we're seeing that um, in the, the, the probably the, one of the largest um, threats to human life and animal life on this planet, which is climate change. And coming from an indigenous perspective and from my culture, I can see how this is playing out. So, um, and I can understand how this has happened just because people have lost connection to nature and they've commodified it and privatized it. Um, and due to that disconnect, we are now facing um, a mass, massive catastrophe. Um, and if you look at the picture here where it talks about, about Western science, um, has all the words like control, like controlling the environment. Um, it's, it's very focused on individualism and kind of um, competitiveness, and it's very high, um, high, hierarchical, goal orientated. Where us, our knowledge system is very, it's focused around um, cyclical kind of shared kinship and um, a shared responsibility to care for nature and um, animals who we consider our family. Um, and moving on, um, this is another uh, awesome graph that kind of gets um, a Venn diagram that gets the point across. So it talks a bit about, you've got the indigenous perspective, but also the Western perspective of nature and ecology and the environment. 
and how we can bridge the gap actually, like how we can bridge a gap between these knowledge systems so that we can live healthier, happier lives. Um, and moving on from this, I would like to officially, officially start the talk in which I am going to talk a bit about um, to a couple of Wurundjeri seasons. So there's seven Wurundjeri seasons. Um, and the first one that I'll be talking about today is wadding season. And so wadding season is wombat season. So wadding is wandry for wombat. And this season coincides during April and July. Um, and so this is when the weather is, the temperature is very cool. Um, it, you have a lot of rainy, have a lot of rainy weather. You've got very misty mornings. This is when our wombats start to emerge from their burrows to bask and graze in the sunlight. So they just finished hibernating and they're just taking advantage of um, the food that's available for them. Um, at this time, we also have the bullenbullen, which is the superb lyrebird, the male, perform his intricate and beautiful courtship dances. Um, and at this time also, the days are very short and the nights are very, very long. Um, this is also a time where the Wurundjeri people traditionally would eat the heart of the kombadik, which is, I hope I said that correctly, but it is um, a very important food source when other vegetation, other fruit and veg are just not available. It's very high at the heart of it. It's actually very high, um, it's actually very high in starch. So it's very nutritious and filling. Um, and linking this into the heavens, the stars, uh, this is when we see the constellation Sagittarius and it rises in the southeast um, after sunset, indicating the midpoint of cold weather. And um, moving on to the next season. Hi, Jesse. Yeah. So just before you continue, um, I think we're in the wrong view on your presentation. So oh, yeah. um, I texted you, but I don't think you saw it. <laughs> So um, are you able to change the view? So um, um, so I think what we're seeing is your um, your desktop. Oh, OK. Right, because I can see the little, um, like I can see my little self. Yeah, so if you um, start sharing your, your content again and try to grab it in that, um, just do the, the presentation mode and then um, I'll upload it again for you. Thanks to everybody um, for your patience. Yeah, thank you for bearing with us when we're having this um, technical issue. Um, yeah, I'll see what I can do on my end to fix this. Okay. So thanks everyone, just bear with us, but... Um, it's, so, it's great so far. Thanks so much, Jesse. Yeah, no worries. My pleasure. Um, okay, I'm going to go into mo um, presenter mode again. Let me know if it is working currently. Um, can you see the slides now? Uh, not just yet, but we'll give it a moment. Uh, maybe try again. It hasn't come up for me. OK. I think it should be working now. How? Yep, I can see it. And let's send live. OK. And now we have the live bird. Yep. I'm moving on. Um, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, everyone, for bearing with us while we have these technical difficulties. Um, so, yeah, moving on, I would like to show a, a, beautiful, a few short seconds of this amazing, intricate, superb live board um, courting display. It's a bit loud, too. Very interesting, um, very mesmerizing too. I can definitely see why a female lyrebird would be very um, interested in a male lyrebird. Okay, 
onto the next slide, if it will let me have issues again, um, which is not fun. Okay, and I've got another video um, of like the mimicking abilities of libraries, which are just absolutely amazing. Um, and I just wanted to share a few seconds of that too. Um, they're really good at um, mimicking construction sounds, actually. <laughs> at a construction site. And you've got a hammer there. That's kind of just there. Um, yeah, they're amazing birds. They're probably one of my favorite. They're um, endemic to Australia. Um, and they, um, they're one of a few species that show um, sexual dimorphism. And um, moving on. Again, um, moving on. Yeah, I want to talk a bit about pornet season or tadpole season, as it's called in Rundry. So at this season, um, you'll start to see uh, uh, male frogs calling. Um, and I've, I've, for example, I've got the southern brown tree frog, which makes a very interesting sound. It sounds like a cree, 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 um, and that's the tadpole. Um, and they breed year round as well. And they're one of a few species of frog that are endemic to Victoria. Um, and the second picture on the right, I have a picture of amazing Uncle Bruce Pascoe um, at, with a murnong or yam daisy. Um, and yam daisies during the seasons um, sustain the Wurundjeri people. Um, so it was a very important food source. It tastes a bit like coconut and it's actually very, very high in um, I think it was like they did research where it was eight eight percent higher than a your average um, potato um, when it comes to um, carbohydrates. Um, I've also got a picture of a lovely Tasmanian flax lily. Um, so this unfortunately this species of lily is toxic to people so you can't eat them but there are some species in which you can. Um, there are actually 41 species of which half are endemic to Australia and found, found in Australia. Um, and this other photo at the very bottom here, um, which I'm sure hopefully most people are, um, are quite familiar with, is the Pycorowa, which is not, not it, despite what it looks like, um, it's not related to the magpie doll. Um, and this is a specific species that is, uh, that is native to Victoria. Um, and kind of moving on, I've also got a video, hopefully it plays, of a call, of a Pai Kurawang's call. Um, it's very, um, I hear it at the moment pretty much every morning. Um, so I'll play a bit of the clip for you. It's a very beautiful sound. It's probably one of my favourite bird calls, actually. And on the um, very bottom right, I've also got a picture of, it doesn't look very appetising, but it's actually the regurgitated pellets that pied curl lungs. Um, so it's basically seeds and fruits and vegetables and nuts of those fruits, um, of those fruits and vegetables that they regurgitate. They're actually excellent pollinators. Um, and so um, moving, actually moving on, technical difficulties again. <laughs> um, and I think I'll hand over to Dwayne and Dwayne will talk a bit about Indigenous um, Torres Strait Islander astronomy. And I'll stop Jess. Awesome. Okay, can you hear or see me? Yes, we can hear you and they will be able to see you momentarily. Thanks, Dwayne. You see the, the correct end of the spectrum of slides? Uh, slides haven't come up yet, but we can see your face. <laughs> So just let me know when they come up. 
Uh, maybe try to share again, Dwayne. We've always got a fun challenge here, don't we? Yeah. Who's your friend in the background there? Oh, that's a cat named Frau Frau. Loves <laughs> to <even> play. <laughs> uh, here we go. Okay. Let's try this. Let's see how it goes. Yes? Yep. It's coming it up. Thank you. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks, Jesse, for that uh, amazing first half of the talk. Uh, fantastic stuff. I love seeing the link between the animals and the stars, especially with stuff here in Kulin Nation. Um, quickly, before we begin, um, I'm also sitting here in Melbourne, which is Wurundjeri country where I am. And I like to pay my respects to elders past and present and recognize the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of where I'm sitting in Melbourne now. Um, what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes is talk to you about the star knowledge that has been shared with me by elders in the Torres Strait, specifically on the island of Mare. Uh, this is the eastern part of the Torres Strait. This is the Marian people. Um, on here I show Marian astronomy of Zenith Kez. So Zenith Kez is the traditional name of the Torres Strait itself. So um couldn't see the image very uh, earlier very well of the language group so this here is the torres strait i'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not but the elders sharing knowledge with me are predominantly from here on mare so for those of you who don't know about mare this is murray island or the home of eddie koiki mabo famous for uh his legal fight to overturn the fiction of terra nullius so that gave uh, rise to indigenous land rights and native title. I've also been fortunate to work with some elders here on MOA in the Eastern Torres Strait, um, in particular, Uncle David Bozen. So in the Torres Strait, um, astronomy is a central part of the culture um, of all across the Torres Straits, especially in Mare. And in fact, in the Torres Strait, as with many Aboriginal cultures and parts of Australia, the title or the role of an astronomer is actually a position in the community and it's the responsibility of that person to observe the stars the planets the sun and the moon it's important for them to observe their movements and any changes in their properties because from that information you're going to be able to ascertain a whole world of knowledge in that world of knowledge i'm going to focus primarily on the scientific knowledge obviously i'm not indigenous um, so it's not really appropriate for me to try to talk about that from a cultural perspective because I can't. But I can certainly talk about some of the science behind that. And as Jesse mentioned before, this is the intersection between these two knowledge systems. This is the cultural interface. In the Torres Strait, especially in the Western Islands, there's a term for this person, an astronomer. It's Zugabama Baig. This literally means star person. And the Zugabama Baig is responsible for uh, keeping track of the motions of the stars and sharing that knowledge through oral tradition, song, and dance. And in particular, um, this lino cut from David Bozen, the famous MOA artist, um, that knowledge is shared through the warp. And the warp is this hourglass shaped drum with the drum head that is made of goanna skin. And it's through the warp, through the drum, that the traditional uh, knowledge is passed on about the stars. In the Torres Strait, uh, most of it features, most of the knowledge features around the story of Tagai. So it's Tagai in the Eastern Islands and Togai in the Western, Northern and Central Islands. Um, Togai was a great fierce warrior, uh, an expert fisherman, um, just a, a, a force to be reckoned with all around. Uh, Tagai had a first mate, a brother named Kareg in the Eastern Islands, in the Western Islands it was Kang and a crew of 12 men called the Zugables. Tagai, Kang, or Kareg, and the Zugables went out on a fishing expedition. And while they were out, uh, they were having no luck catching any fish, so Tagai went onto the reef to find a more suitable place. The Zugables, growing hot and tired, decided to start consuming some of the rations for their long journey. Um, before they knew it, and despite the warnings of Kareg, the crew had consumed all of their rations and ended up drinking and consuming all of Togai's rations and water. When Togai got back, as you can imagine, he was extremely upset. Upset would be a minor way of putting it. He flew into a rage and he killed all 12 of the Zugables. Uh, the men who were aligned in two rows of six along the canoe, he tied them up into two groups of six and cast them into the sea where they drowned. 
Then he cast them up into the sky where they ascended as the stars of Usium and Seg, or in the Western Islands, Usium and Utimal. These are the stars we think of as the cluster of the Pleiades and the stars in the belt and scabbard of Orion. Tagai and Kareg went up to the opposite side of the sky. Tagai is a, a very large figure standing quite prominent in the night sky. His left hand is the Southern Cross. His right hand is the Western constellation of Corvus, the crow. And all the different stars relate to, I'll make sure nobody's texting me that I'm doing something wrong. Okay, no, we're all good. Um, he's holding a spear in his two hands and the prongs of the spear are the stars in Muska. What you see here um, is an image of Tagai from the Western Torres Strait, where he's actually holding a fruit in one hand and a spear in the left hand. But the stars in the constellations of Lupus and Centaurus trace out his eyes, mouth, elbows, all the body parts, and he's standing in his canoe. The canoe is the arch of stars we know as Scorpius. And the bright red star in Scorpius, the star Antares, is Kareg or Kang. Kareg is sitting at the bow, and Taga, I'm sorry, Taga is standing at the stern, and Kareg is sitting at the bow. The stars that loop around to form the stinger of Scorpius and the tail, that represents the anchor of Tagai's canoe. So when Tagai and Kareg rise and set throughout the year, they indicate the changing seasons. They indicate the behavior of the plants, the behavior of animals, and they inform the people about when to go hunting, when to go fishing, when to plant their gardens, when to do pretty much everything. And when those groups of stars are not visible in the sky, the Zugables, Seg and Usium, they are on the opposite side of the sky when they rise and set throughout the year also tells you things. Now, the reason Tagai put Usium and Seg on the opposite side of the sky is because he was so angry at them. He wanted them to be completely away from them. Now, that's in the constellation Orion and Taurus, and Tagai mostly is in the constellation of Scorpius and um, Lupus and Centaurus. For those of you who may know a little bit about Western astronomy, it actually kind of mirrors some of the Greek traditions, because in the Greek traditions, Orion got into a battle with a scorpion, and they stabbed each other in the heel and in the heart. And the gods placed them on opposite sides of the sky to keep them away from each other. So you find some remarkable similarities in these traditions from different cultures separated by space and time all around the world. So this is a, a Merriam calendar from the Torres Strait. I'm using that same image you can see here of Tagai going around that. And what it shows is the different times of the year and the different seasons. The Torres Strait is broken up primarily between the dry season, the Sager, and the wet season, the Kuki. There's also the Nege season, which is sort of the second half of the dry season, um, sort of a transitionary season. The wet season, the monsoon, the cookie goes from sort of late December until about May, where it transitions over to the Sager, and the Nege sort of occurs the last few months of the year. There's a couple more slight different seasons or sort of sub-seasons within that, but those are the main ones. And what this calendar here shows you is the position of Tagai in the sky throughout the year as it rises and sets at dusk, so at sunset. And of course, those months of November up through February and March, Tagai is below the horizon. Those are the summer months when the constellation Orion or the constellations of Usium and Seg are high in the sky. And interestingly enough, later in the year, when Tagai starts to set below the horizon, he's seen diving into the sea. As he dives into the sea, it splashes water up into the air, which falls as the monsoon rains. Now, Uncle Sigar Passi is the senior elder on Mer. Um, he's a Dawarab man, so there's three little islands there, Mer, Dawar, and Wair. His traditional family is from Dawar, one of the two islets off the main island. And a couple of years ago, I he put together this, this beautiful little image, um, which is supposed to be for a coin. It's not going to be this image, but I'm going to talk about that coin a little bit later. But this beautiful little drawing that he did is fantastic because it shows from the island of Dawar, there's this very large hill called Apaser. A means big and Paser means hill. 
And he says that when the hand of Tagai, when Tagai spears Apaser, and remember his left hand is the Southern Cross, it's the turtle breeding season. So that northern peninsula on that island, which I'm going to show you here, this is Dawar Island down here. This peninsula right here is a very common breeding ground for turtles. So Uncle Seagar is talking about looking up here in this direction. You can see Alpas there, this big hill right here. So as you're facing that at sunset, you see Tagai spearing Alpas there. That's a turtle breeding season. The turtle breeding season, their nesting season, really goes from about July to October. So right about this time of the year, you're going to see that. And when you're standing on the island, looking towards the south, after sunset, you're going to see Tagai spearing Apaser. I'm just looking on my phone to make sure I'm keeping track of time because I can't see it from your perspective. So this is Mare right here. This is the island. The main community is on the northwestern part of the island. This right here is the, the uh, airstrip. And this is the school right up here. And down here are Dawar, Dawar and Wair. Um, these are extinct volcanic um, islands, and they're right at the very tip of the Great Barrier Reef. The islands are very rich in soil, which is why gardening is very prominent on the island. And gardening links into something very interesting that ties in with the property of the stars. The elders on the island tell me that your skill, your ability to be able to read nature is tied in with your ability to be able to read the stars. And your ability to read the stars ties into two things. Your ability to observe the changes in the positions of the stars throughout the year, which we looked at an example of that with Tagai and the Zugables. It's also your ability to observe and read the subtle changes in the properties of the stars. So when we look at the stars at night, we notice certain things about them. We'll notice their color, for example. Some stars are red, some stars are blue, some are kind of uh, yellowish or white. Those all have special significance. We also notice the changing brightness of those stars. And one of the common things to look at is the way the stars twinkle. Now, the twinkling stars are, you know, a common thing for sort of Western poetry. But for astrophysicists, um, they're very problematic. Um, the twinkling stars prevent us from being able to get good readings through our telescopes. We're always trying to find ways of overcoming scintillation or twinkling of stars. In fact, we'll build telescopes and observatories at the top of mountains to try to get high above the atmosphere or spend billions of dollars like the Hubble telescope putting them in space. That gets rid of the atmosphere altogether or developing these really complex sort of uh, engineering systems to overcome that. But in tr indigenous traditions, especially in the Torres Strait, the twinkling stars are not a problem to be overcome. They're a very useful tool for telling you about the world around you. And what the elders tell us about this is learning how to observe the way the stars twinkle because of the things we know about the stars universally. The stars twinkle because of turbulence in the atmosphere. That turbulence is due to wind movement. So if you can see the stars twinkling quickly, you know that there is high wind. If they're twinkling slowly, low wind. If they're not twinkling at all, no wind. But you can also look at other properties of the stars. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to, hopefully it'll come up, I'm going to play a little video from you this is uh, Uncle Alo Topham, OAM. He was just honored with an OAM um, this year. He's shared a lot of traditional knowledge with me, and he's recorded some of the star songs from the Torres Strait. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a clip of one of the songs called Huer Na Sky Sreda. Huer means star, Na Sky Sreda basically means twinkling. So the song is called The Twinkling Stars. It was written by a Dalbarab man named George Passy back, I believe, about the 1960s. Um, the song is in Merriam Mir, and I've put the Merriam words up on it, and I'll translate for you after I've played the video. So if you can't hear the sound, somebody in the background give me a text and I'll make sure we get that up.
So what Uncle Allo is singing there is a song, a, a more modern song, based on ancient knowledge. And Uncle Sigar Passy, who I mentioned before, um, the singer elder, was kind enough to write the lyrics down for me in Mary and Mir, and Uncle Allo helped me translate them. Uncle Allo and Uncle Sigar are two of just a handful of people left whose first language is Mary and Mir, and they speak it fluently. Um, Uncle Allo is also a trained linguist and quite an academic himself, uh, just like George Passy. George Passy um, had graduate degrees from the University of Queensland um, in a couple of different areas. So um, the elders there and, and all across Australia are very knowledgeable, not only about ancient traditional knowledge, but about a great many other things too that I think oftentimes people don't get uh, acknowledged for, they don't get recognized for. But what the song is telling you, the, the translation of the lyrics is, why is it so calm tonight? Why are the stars twinkling like embers in a fire? It's a sign that of the uh, big wind that's bringing rain clouds from the southeast and moving them to the northwest. Why, is, why are the stars twinkling so brightly? And what Uncle Allo was talking about, what he explained to me, is that towards the end of the year, um, around October to December, you get a period during the late Nege where you get a period of doldrum. It's very, very still. It's hot, it's still, the stars are very clear, and they're twinkling. They can start twinkling quite brightly towards the end of the year, even though on the ground it's dead still. Because as we said, the twinkling stars, that's telling you about wind movement. And what happens at the end of the year is you start getting that transition of the trade winds, the predominant trade winds from the cool southeasterlies to the hot, moist northwesterlies um, begin taking these rain clouds from the southeasterlies and begins moving them to the northwest. So as uh, it takes these rain clouds up, that starts to bring in the monsoon rains. So the Og Wog he was talking about is the, the uh, big winds. Remember, Og is big and wind... Uh, is Wog. And Giru, Giru, I can't remember the name of it exactly, I uh, can't ever say it correctly. Um, those are specific types of clouds, not just a generic clouds, they're so specifically rain clouds. And this is talking about that transition. So you're looking at the stars late at night um, and you see them start to twinkle really quickly. The, out, the trade winds are very high altitude in that part of the Torres Strait at that time of the year. So that's just one of the signs that you read. But another man up there, Uncle William Barrow, taught me just last year, about two years ago, that the people look for a certain type of butterfly late in the year. This butterfly, the female tends to stay hidden inside the bushes, but when a storm is approaching, you're gonna see the males fluttering about. And the males he described as being, they have the same colors as the reggae, the reggae colors of the reggae flag, sort of black, gold, red, and green. Um, so he says, if you look at the stars twinkling quite brightly, you see this bird, or the, sorry, this bird, this uh, butterfly flying around, and you look at the colors of the twinkling stars. Um, do the stars start to appear very blue in color? If all of that is the case, you know that rain's coming, a storm's quickly approaching. And other elders told me about the stars being very blue when they twinkle, and I thought this is quite curious. What does this mean? And it took me a while, because as is the case when you're learning from the elders, there's stuff they want you to figure out on your own. Uh, and I thought about it, and I realized that what they were talking about brought me back to my early days in chemistry and physics. And the reason that the stars would appear blue at night, even though the color blue is not a color we see very well with our eyes at night, it's because water absorbs red and green wavelengths of light. So this sciencey graph here shows you how much of that, uh, how much of the light coming in is absorbed versus the wavelength of light. So you can see over here, this means that if there's really high absorption in the red and then pretty moderate abs absorption of that starlight in the green and yellow. But down the blue end of the spectrum, uh, water is very poor at absorbing light. So when there's a lot of humidity in the atmosphere, it can make the stars fuzzy and it can absorb that starlight coming in. So the starlight we see with our eyes tends to be a bit bluer in color. So that tells you not only about the changing seasons, 
and about rain coming, but you can also look to the animals. Because as the elders said, it's not just the stars. You look at the clouds, you look at the animals, you look at the entire environment in a holistic way. One of the other really interesting things the elders taught me about that I've seen in a couple of other places around the world since then is how to look at the cusps of the moon. So we see the crescent cusp of the moon like this. I always refer to it as the Cheshire Grin from Alice in Wonderland when the cat's sort of disappearing. Where the cusps point um, when it's low on the horizon, it can either be at sunrise or sunset, depending on whether the moon is waxing or waning. The angle of those, the tilt of those, occur at different times of the year, and they can coincide with um, certain weather patterns and seasonal patterns. So again, this is Uncle Seagar. He painted two images of the crescent moon. So this is just after sunset at different times of the year. And I'm going to put the images back and forth and have a look at them and tell me what you notice. They're tilted at different angles. But not only that, look at the types of clouds that are visible in the sky and look at the water itself. Look what the reflection of the moonlight is, the types of waves that are on the sea. So in some areas, when the moon is tilted like this and the cuffs are pointing straight up, the people say, well, this is the wet season. The moon is filling with water. And when it tilts out on its side, it pours out. That's why the dry season. In other areas, it's exactly opposite. They say, well, this is the moon filling up with water. It's the dry season. It's collecting all the water, so nothing is hitting the ground. But later on in the wet season, the moon tilts and all the water pours out. So depending on the Torres Strait on the time of the year, whether it's near the summer solstice or the winter solstice, the angle of the cusps will be different and you'll get a different rainy season or, or sorry, they'll show the different seasons. One's a rainy season, one's the dry season. As it turns out, this is more of the rainy season and that's more of the dry season. And of course, when we look at the position of the sun throughout the year, we notice it moves across the horizon at sunrise and sunset. And that's referred to as the analemma. That's if you were to take a photograph of the moon every evening at the same time, you're gonna see this strange sort of infinity sign or figure eight sign. And if you're wondering why there's a bigger loop on this side than this side, it's because at this point, we're actually moving, uh, we're further away from the sun than normal. Therefore, we're orbiting the sun a little bit slower as we come to this part, we're actually a little bit closer to the sun than normal and we orbit faster. That's just going back to Kepler's laws of motion. But this stuff was known by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as well. In this little village of Kuban in the western Torres Strait Island of Moa, the people look at this archipelago of islands in the background to be able to distinguish different seasonal uh, times of the year based on the setting sun. So for example, this island of Tuin right here signifies uh, the northerly most point of the sun, which marks out the uh, summer solstice, I'm sorry, the winter solstice. And down as it moves in this direction, it gets down to the farthest end towards the summer solstice. And the summer solstice, incidentally, in late December, marks out the start of the cookie, the monsoon season. So it's not just about the solstices, it's when the sun sets between specific islands. These just simply show the solstices and the equinoxes. But as they're moving back and forth across the horizon, where they set relative to the islands in the ugon can tell you about the turtle season, or the dugong season, or the sagir, or the cookie. They tell you about different things. And that knowledge was developed in situ, in that place, from that specific observing point. Because if you looked at a different place, you're not going to see those same islands in the background. So I would like to wrap up before we get to the q and A. I've just gone a right about time, so I've got a couple more minutes. I want to tell you about a couple of really exciting things that have happened in this space. Um, the Royal Australian Mint has commissioned for three coins to be based on indigenous astronomy. They're silver $1 coins and they're all commemorative, which means they're not circulating, but you can purchase them from the Mint. The first one came out a couple of months ago. It's called Gugerman. This is the emu in the sky from Radjuri country. Radjuri are the Aboriginal people of Central West New South Wales. The artwork in the coin is from a Radjuri artist named Scott Sauce Towney. Um, he's from Peak Hill, New South Wales. And this is a picture of Uncle uh, Towney right here. He did a whole series of artworks on indigenous astronomy, on Radjuri astronomy, 
that are being developed into education programs for things like Stellarium. So these are two of them that you can see in the background. You might not realize it, but behind his shoulder, that's actually referring to a tree that's the Southern Cross. And this Goanna, that's actually the stars in Scorpius. Again, that's the canoe of Togai. In about a week or two, the Mint's going to release a new coin from Yamaji Wajari artist named Christine Collard. And it's going to be these stars up here, which are referring to the Seven Sisters. So keep your eyes out for that. The third coin is not going to come out until the middle of next year. I can't tell you what it's about, but I can tell you that Uncle Seagar is the artist, and I'm really looking forward to everybody seeing that. I've I've been the consultant in the background, helping to work with the artist and the mint to ensure that everything is done properly through protocol. The communities are happy, the artists and the others are happy, and everybody's quite shocked this is happening. So the last thing I want to mention before we finish up is that recently five asteroids have been named after Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander academics, elders, and a community. So I'm a member of the IAU and we're responsible for naming everything in space. The working group I'm in is actually the working group on star names, which there are now six Aboriginal star names in the sky. So six stars have official Aboriginal names. One of them is the fifth star of the Southern Cross. So that smaller star is known as Guinan. But I work with my colleagues in the working group that names asteroids, and we had five of those named. One is Miriam for the Marian people. One is Seagar Passi after Uncle Seagar Passi. One is Bill Edom Damaharni, a senior Wadaman elder from the Northern Territory. One is named after Professor Martin Nakata, a Torres Strait Islander academic who's helped get a lot of this research in indigenous astronomy kicked off. And the last one is named after Professor Marcia Langton here at the University of Melbourne. And that was named in honor of her role helping to develop or leading the development of the national curriculum for indigenous astronomy, fire and water. So the final thing um, is there's a whole generation of Aboriginal astrophysics students in the space. You've obviously uh, met Jesse tonight, who's an ecology student working in this space. But there's also some Aboriginal people who are pursuing degrees in physics. There's only one PhD qualified astrophysicist so far who's Aboriginal. And that's Dr. Stacy Mater, who works at the Parks Radio Telescope for the CSIRO. You have Carly Noon, Crystal Dinopoli, and Kirsten Banks, who are all becoming quite famous now, and Pete Swanson and Peter Reeve. And there's one more person I want to add to this, and that is Jason Rimmer. That's a Ghana person who's pursuing a physics degree here at the University of Melbourne and who has been working with us looking at astronomy and stone arrangements in Victoria. So if you'd like to know anything more about this, go to our website at aboriginalastronomy.com.au and we're posting everything's on there, books, journal articles, content, videos, information about people, everything is on this website. So thank you. Thanks so much, Dwayne. And Jesse, that was fantastic. Um, I am gonna pop myself up here. Okay, so we're now moving into the Q&A. So we have some questions um, in, in the chat already, uh, but if you have anything that's come to mind, um, please uh, post it in the chat and we will um, get Jesse and Duane to answer your questions. So the first one that came through um, is from Anonymous. Uh, so what are ways in which non-Indigenous people can get involved in Indigenous astronomy in, a respect, in respectful and appropriate ways? Uh, who would like to tackle that one? Yeah, I'll, Jessie. I'll, I'll see if I can have a bit of a go at this. I mean, I might tag in Dwayne as well, since he's more kind of got the, um, the physics, physics and um, the astronomy background than I do. Um, I suppose respectful ways that um, non-Indigenous people can get involved in Indigenous astronomy, um, especially in a respectful and appropriate way, um, is to always, when you're sharing things about Indigenous culture, um, to have us uh, have our not our knowledge as being like the the people who that knowledge belongs to, just so that we can um, have our agency. I suppose also just it really depends on the way that you approach it and um, go and go out finding that knowledge. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Duane? I know that you're probably 
yeah, more on top of this than well, I am. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm in this space, and of course, it's a very tricky space um, because it's important that we center Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and faces people and knowledge. So people like myself, non-Indigenous people who, who I mean, I've, I've been working in this space for 12 years now, and you know, when I started, we didn't know of any Aboriginal people who had qualifications in astrophysics and, and whatnot. And there's a lot that I've learned over the last decade. And a lot of my practices have changed in that time. There's a lot of things that I've learned in that time. And there were mistakes I made along the way. And it's important that um, people like myself, if you want to get involved, that's fine. But you need to approach local community. You need to learn from the elders. Um, you need to get involved in centering voices. I think in this case, it's more about us taking the privilege that we have and using that in an appropriate and respectful way to ensure that we're centering the voices and faces um, and knowledges of the people um, who it belongs to. And of course, if you, you know, I've had people email me, non-Indigenous people email me and say, look, they learn from somebody so-and-so years ago, this experience they had where they found this exciting bit of knowledge. You know, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with sharing that kind of information. Um, there's only a limited amount we can do with that because we're just sort of revealing, revealing people's anecdotes. But there's nothing wrong with sort of sharing things that you've been taught necessarily with others. But we've got to be careful because a lot of the knowledge in the past was collected um, in not terribly ethical ways. And this is one of the issues when we go back even through the archives for what the old anthropologists wrote down. A lot of times what they wrote down was wrong. Um, it was very biased. Um, I think 40% of, of my job is just going back and correcting all the mistakes the anthropologists and ethnographers made because they didn't know a lot about their astronomy. And it's very easy to see what the elders were talking about, but what they've actually written down and published in the books and the journals is inaccurate. And sometimes that information gets fed back to community. And because of colonization, because some of this knowledge has been degraded and lost or fragmented, <clears throat> communities are wanting to kind of come back and, and piece this back together. And I've been invited by some communities to help do this. And we have to make sure that if we're working with the communities to bring this stuff back together, that it's accurate. Because it does happen, and I've seen case after case, where something the anthropologist wrote down that was wrong was fed back to the community. And communities like, OK, great. Well, and they start sharing that. And then it's inaccurate. It's not the fault of the community. It's the fault of the Western academics who got things wrong. So we have to ensure that if we're working with communities, that we do our job to make sure it's, that it's as accurate and correct as possible. That's not the easiest thing to do. And sometimes it's not always, it's certainly not always going to be perfect. But that's some of the responsibilities that non-Indigenous people like myself have in this space. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, we have uh, we've had lots more questions pop up in in the chat. Um, so let me just find the next one. Um, the next one is how much of the current Torres Strait Islander day to day life, e.g. farming times, is still driven by their astronomy? The answer is a lot. Um, this knowledge is still shared in community. You know, the, the Torres Strait that community is one of those. I mean, that was the first place the London Missionary Society went. So that was one of the you know early days of colonization in that regard. And but you know the community still share this knowledge. I've I've been in community. I've been walking along the beach at night, um, waiting to observe the stars, and had some of the local kids come up because I speak at the schools. The elders invite me to come speak at the schools uh, when I'm there. And these the island's not very big. There's only about 450 people on the island and about 50 students. So, you know, you, you get to know everybody pretty quickly. And I've had the students come up to me, the kids come up as young as six, seven and eight years old. And just as the sun is going down, they start pointing stuff out in the sky and they're telling me, oh, that's this is Ilwell. This is the evening star. This is Venus. And this over here is the Dogai. This is Arcturus. And this is I'm going, this, these kids know more about not just about Merriam astronomy, but about Western astronomy. They know more, know more about it than the bloody undergraduates I'm teaching here in the physics program at Melbourne Uni. No, no offense to them, but He's like seven year old kids who know this stuff. And they're also in the water playing with the sharks, like playing with sharks. And I look around, there's no adults around. You know, I see these, you know, helicopter parents in Sydney and Melbourne who can't let their kids away from them for five, you know, more than five meters away without freaking out. There's no adults around. The kids are in the water, like tugging the tails of the sharks and feeding them. And they're telling me like what you do if you're in the water. Like if the sharks come up, this is what you do. This is what you don't do. 
They know all of this knowledge because they've been brought up in it. It's their lived experience. And the elders still tell me they watch the phase of the moon or the position of the sun in the sky when they go planting or go gardening. They observe the twinkling of stars. This knowledge is still being handed down. It's still being act it's still very active in the daily lives of the people up there. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, our next question um, is from Anonymous. Um, has the decrease in dark skies slash increase in light pollution affected Indigenous astronomy? Jesse, you want to go with that? Yeah, I'll try my hand at that. Um, from my experience in my country, it absolutely has. Um, so my country, Yoda Yoda country, a lot of it's been cleared off for farming and there's a lot of um, light pollution. And so we're not able to see our ant like the, the stars that we use as guides to um, for where we know our ancestors are, ancestral beings like um, Biyami are. Um, so my, yeah, in my, the short answer is absolutely, um, it has affected it. Um, would you like to add on to that, Dwayne? Yeah, of course. I mean, preserving dark skies is one of the things we're really becoming more active in because this is our shared astronomical heritage. Whether you're indigenous or not indigenous, our ability, our connection with the sky is, is one of the oldest connections we've had. Um, it's one of the reasons I think astronomy is one of the always considered one of the oldest sciences, one, one of the most popular ones. Um, and what the elders have told me um, across the country is that everything on the ground is reflected in the sky. Uh, the stars serve as a map. They're also a memory space. And if you can't see them, then it's an active erasure of those memories. So, you know, I've, I've published a paper with another Aboriginal colleague and an artist uh, named uh, Crystal Dinopoli and Bon Mott on how light pollution is actually a form of cultural genocide. Uh, but that's across the board. You know, for better or for worse, the Southern Cross is the most Australian constellation in the sky. Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander cultures across the country, very close links to the Southern Cross, as is even colonial Australia. But from the cities and even regional towns, it's getting harder and harder to see all the stars in the Southern Cross. Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, you can't even see the fifth star, Guinan. You can't even see it. So how can we maintain that connection to the stars? How can you maintain those traditions, those star maps, those connections to the sky, when you can't even see the damn thing? So yes, light pollution is a major problem. But up in the Torres Strait on Mare, fortunately, it's not a huge problem there. I can see things up there that I need a telescope to see down here. And it's really amazing to be able to see truly dark skies. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. We have another question uh, from Kerry. Thanks, Kerry. Um, are you able to comment on the stone arrangement, Woody Luong, in the Werribee Plains? Either of you know much about that one? Yes, so we've we've been working with the communities out there for a number of years to understand more about the the arrangement itself. Um, from what we understand, not a lot is really known about it. Um, a lot of the the traditions about it, the knowledge about it, was really fragmented to such a degree where not much has been passed down that we really know about. And, you know, we can go out there and we can we can measure the stones and look at the orientations and see that it appears to align to the setting position of the sun throughout the year at the solstices and the equinoxes. But much beyond that, we don't really know. And even the name Word of Yuang itself isn't even the name of the stone arrangement. Word of Yuang means big hill in the Wathrong, Wadawurrung language. It's the tallest of the Yuyangs, which is commonly called Flinders Peak because, you know, got a colonial name for everything, right? But that tells the Yuangs is where to Yuang. But during the 19th century, that whole area between the Little River, the town of the Little River, Yuangs, and the Little River itself was known as the Wordy Yuang Shire. And that name went on until the early part of the 20th century. So the name Wordy Yuang actually comes from the fact that it's a stone arrangement in the Wordy Yuang Shire, even though it's not the actual name of it. Um, but, you know, there's there's work with the communities out there to try to learn more about it. But, you know, it's it's a contested space. Um, and there's not a lot known, so we're we're trying to we're trying to do what we can to work with the communities out there, and, and hopefully down the road we can find out more. Thanks, Dwayne and Jesse. Um, we have some more questions. If if you're happy to, I realize it's eight o'clock, but are you guys happy to to continue on? 
Yeah, great. Fine, um, so I've got a question from Jay. Um, what are some links between the stars and ecology? Sounds like this question's made for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> like before when I was uh, discussing Wurundjeri seasons, so we do have, um, especially with the clonation, we do have some examples of some ecology and um, it's uh, examples of animals and plants aligning with the movement of stars in the sky. Um, I know touched rough, roughly upon the worrying season and so that's a, a clear example of like how the constellation Sagittarius um, when it uh, when it rises in the southeast of sunset that it is used by the Rundry people as an indicator of the midpoint of cold weather and when they use that star they use that constellation sorry um, to know when certain animals are going to emerge from hibernation when certain animals are going to start breeding, um, when they're going to you know, engage in, in mating behaviour, also when they're more plentiful. So when it's best to harvest eggs or um, when it's best to hunt this animal because they've got a, a large population. Um, so there's yeah, there's heaps of applications of um, of like star knowledge in, yeah, in indigenous overall like ecology and um, um, I guess the yeah, ecology knowledge. And I'm um, passing to Dwayne too if you have anything you wanted to add about that, especially from the Torres Strait. Well, look, there's about a million examples, but I'll do one really quickly. Um, in the Torres Strait, the people have a name for a sharp constellation called Bazom, or it's Bazom in the east and Baidom in the west. And these are the stars that I'm very familiar with being from the US and the Northern Hemisphere. This is our equivalent to the Southern Cross and it's the Big Dipper. It's probably the most famous of all of our constellations. Um, they're actually the seven brightest stars in the Western constellation Ursa Major. But from Australia, uh, the Northern part anyway, you can't really see it the Southern half of Australia because it's a very northerly constellation. So from down here in Melbourne and Sydney, you're not gonna see it except for maybe the very tip of one star comes barely above the horizon. But in the Torres Strait, it's a shark, and that constellation is upside down. It actually looks just like a shark, it, you know, the outlines of that uh, dipper upside down. It doesn't get very high above the horizon, but when it rises and sets, it tells you about the changing seasons and the behavior of the shark. And in particular, at sunset, when the nose of the shark dives into the sea, um, that's the shark breeding season. And you're going to see the sharks coming really close to the shore to hunt the sardines. And later on, when the shark dives deep into the sea, Water rushes through the gills and comes down as the monsoon rains. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Dwayne and Jesse. Um, we have like a, a bunch of more questions, but uh, I mean, would you? Um, there's a really great one from Shu that I would hope, hope I can sneak in if that's OK, and then maybe um, uh, we could get you guys to to answer questions offline um, if that if that will help. But or if you're happy to kind of sit with us for a bit longer, um, please let me know. But um, I'll share Shu's question. Um, so Shu wants to know, are there any resources on planetary correspondences of indigenous plants? I'm referring to the traditional Western practice of planting, picking and making medicines on the hours of corresponding planets. Not sure if this kind of practice is performed in indigenous culture. Jesse, do you want to say anything? Um, I guess my knowledge is still somewhat limited. Like I'm still doing a lot of research myself, um, particularly looking at the looking at the connections. And um, but I think yeah, I'm happy to hand that to you, Dwayne, if you wanted okay. to answer that. Well, the, the elders and communities have taught me a little bit about this, but it doesn't relate to planets. You know, it's, it's when the stars, whatever position they happen to be, whether they're high in the sky or rising or setting at either dusk or dawn, or some many of the elders, uh, Uncle Alo Topham was telling me how he plants, or they plant um, gardens based on the position of the moon. Um, planting with respect to the plants is not something that's come up. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are people and cultures that do it. Um, but it's very difficult because the plants, I mean, planet means wandering star. That's the original me meaning is, you know, the, the etymology of the word. They're constantly moving around. So 
they don't actually correspond to a certain time of year that's consistent. So from year to year, they're going to be in different parts of the sky, you know, at different times. So when you plant uh, based on that, I mean, it wouldn't correspond to a weather pattern or a seasonal pattern necessarily. So there might be other significance. Um, I wrote a paper with uh, Kirsten Banks, uh, a, a Rydery student um, now doing a PhD in astrophysics at UNSW, and we went through and, and tried to find everything we could on the planets. I mean, I know we certainly didn't get everything out there, of course, because not much has been published on it, and uh, some elders have shared some knowledge, but none of it talked about planting um, plants uh, in relation to the planets. That tended to be reserved to the sun, the moon, the positions of the stars. Thanks so much, Dwayne and Jesse. Um, now, I, let me know, do you want, we've got a, probably another five questions, um, but I'm happy to be led by you on this one. I'm happy yeah, to keep going through, keep, yeah. Do this and to write it down, so writing sure. it down. Sure, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I will, um, where is the next one? Um, sorry, I'm going through the list of stuff. From Marcus, we have a question. Do Aboriginal people have stories about the cosmos and gods? Um, I can answer that. Absolutely. Um, with some of these stories, though, they are sacred and they are secret. So we can't, unless you're initiated or, or a member of that tribe, that nation, you can't actually share it with people, especially outsiders, those aren't initiated. But some stories that I can think of that are local, that um, uh, you can definitely look up and um, check them out. Like there's, uh, I think Bang Jalaka has a, a few examples of them, like the story about Wa the Crow and his trickery and how he stole fire and brought it to the Wurundjeri people. And it's very, very much similar to the Prometheus kind of story about how he stole um, fire from the Greek gods and gave it to humanity. Um, just seeing if I can quickly give a recap of it. So this particular story is actually probably one of my favourites. Um, it talks a bit about how by stealing fire from the the Pleiades, um, who are a group of young women, um, and they're called the, um, I'm probably going to butcher the name, but um, Karen Guruk, he lost his brilliant white colour and he actually, he got burnt by, he got burnt by the coals and ended up getting his famous black colouring. Um, and in a lot of oral traditions among the Kulin nations, his place in the sky is Canopus. Um, and another other story I can think of too is the story of Bunjil, who's the creator and ancestral being of the older Kulin nation people. Um, and these stories do kind of, they, they, they overlap, or stories about him overlap, but there is difference among them. Um, and there's difference between names as well, but with Bunjil, it's pretty, what I've seen, it's pretty consistent. Um, so Bunjil is the creator of the mountains, the skies, the valleys, the Wurundjeri people, specifically Wurundjeri men. And depending on which version, it's either Pialin uh, the bat, his brother who created women from water, or it's his son Biniel, who's the rainbow. And according to these oral traditions, Bunjil's place in the sky is a star Altair. And his two wives are on other side of him and the rest of his family are also in the skies, in the heavens with him as well. I hope that answered your question. Um, I'll pass to Dwayne too if Dwayne wants to add anything else. Um, I just I quickly just mentioned very briefly that so, sort of a rough equivalent to Bunjil in um, <clears throat> sort of New South Wales area is Miami. And one of the Radjuri stories, not, not really a story, I'm not going to tell a story, but just an aspect of it, is that um, Miami was hunting. I forget it was an emu or a kangaroo. I apologize for not remembering the specifics of that. But um, he was running and tripped over a tree branch and fell over the horizon. Um, there's a lot to the story behind it, of course, but we see him in the sky as the constellation of Orion in the same orientation as the Greek counterpart. It's the belt and the shoulders and the knees and everything, but it's upside down. And the reason he's upside down is because he tripped and fell over the horizon. Um, and interestingly enough, you find that in a few other aboriginal cultures around the country where that same shape of those stars in Orion 
represents a man who's upside down. So upside down as we see it here. Um, and just to mention with a lot of those stories and with the original Greek Orion, uh, there's three stars across the belt and the stars represent a scabbard. They don't represent a scabbard and they didn't represent a scabbard in the old Greek traditions. That was um, <clears throat> cleaned up by the Victorians. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, but uh, it looks like what it looks like. <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne. Uh uh, our next question um, is uh, from Anonymous. And um, would it be possible to have the spear on Tagai shown and drawn out clearly, please? Or do you have a, a link or something that we can share with, with Anonymous so they can get a closer look? I mean, I wish I could do that for you right now. Um, I'd be having a lot less difficulty teaching physics right now online if I had that ability to do it as we speak. <clears throat> but yes, look, the TSRA, the Torres Strait Regional Authority up in the Straits is developing uh, different seasonal calendars and we, we've we been working with them on the Merriam version of Tagai. Because like I said, it's a bit different. Um, the Western Kalalago Ya and those dialects, um, it seems that in the right hand, he's got this, it's sort of like a, a native kind of apple fruit in his right hand, that's the stars of Corvus. And his left hand, he's holding a spear, but the prongs of the spear are down in the pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri. But up in the Torres Strait, he's holding the spear with both hands, and those prongs are the stars in Muska. So if you just pull up a star map online, just look up Southern Cross or Muska, um, those are the stars just below the Southern Cross, and it looks like the prongs of those spears you can see up in the straits. So those uh, star calendars will be out at some point in the, in the near future as educational tools, and you can see the proper Merriam version of Tagai there. Thanks, Duane. Um, our next question is from Andrew, um, who would like to know, are there other stone arrangements used in, in Indigenous astronomy in Australia? Uh, yes, there are there there are, are, are several. Um, we were invited by one community in Victoria to go out and look at a stone arrangement. I'm not going to say where it was or who that community was, um, but they did invite us to go up there and have a look. It's a beautiful stone circle, perfectly symmetrical with standing stones at the four cardinal points and an even number of stones between them. Uh, <clears throat> Jason Rimmer, who's the Garnet person, uh, working with um, Jesse and myself doing a summer scholarship program, got to go to the site and and Jason and I, along with the Tonorong community members, did a survey on the spot. Like they brought us up there and didn't quite know what was going to happen. They said, look, let's let's go. And so we, we actually did the whole survey there. Uh, that'll come down the road uh, after we've done some more some more work on that uh, and with the community's permission, of course. But initially, you're not going to get a stone arrangement with that that has that sort of orientation without a link to the sun or the stars. Um, and there are other stone arrangements around the country that seem to orient. Well, some of the stone arrangements are linked to Boris sites. These are sort of ceremonial grounds in southeastern Australia. And there are two circles connected by a pathway, which is reflected in the Milky Way as the emu. They're actually aligned. The position of those two circles is aligned to the Milky Way when it's perpendicular on the horizon at this time of the year, August and September um, at sunset. So there are different stone arrangements that link to the stars in different ways. Some trace out the positions and some are oriented to the uh, plane of the Milky Way itself. And there's quite a few more that we don't know about yet. Excellent, something for us to look forward to and keep an eye out for. Um, a question from Anonymous. Do the elders who teach astronomy also teach some sort of astrology? Is there a way for a non-Aboriginal person to learn this? Jesse, do you want to go with this one? I mean, I can certainly talk about it, but I'd love to throw this in your, your direction if you've got anything to say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not too sure. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure about, um, or no, really about any indigenous astron um, indigenous astronomy, astro astrology, sorry, astronomy, astrology, I always get those two words confused. Um, I've mainly been taught the astronomy aspect, and I suppose like the totemic um, significance behind certain stars and how um, you can, like other cultural things, but I've never 
um, myself been taught about astrology. No, I'll pass back to you, Darren. It seems like you have right. some things to say about I mean, it. This this is a funny thing that comes up because there's this animosity between astrology and astronomy, and and being an astronomer, I'm, I'm more than familiar with it. <clears throat> and it, it, it raises a, a difficult question because how you define astrology is going to depend on what context you mean it. Um, what people think of is tends to either be a Western form of astrology, astrology or a Vedic form of astrology, and they're quite different, but they've got their own characteristics. I have never run across anything in Australia that's like those, um, where the positions of the stars tell you about your personality. Obviously, people have uh, totems, that might be linked to the stars, and in some places that might be linked to the stars that are visible, that are up in the sky at the time of the year that you're born, say, for example, or something like that. Um, it's not really something that comes up. And interestingly, it's it's really problematic, and I think it's good that we have this sort of open conversation about this, because one of the things that gets thrown at us a lot when we're talking about indigenous astronomy or indigenous star knowledge are people... Um, quite frankly, white racist rednecks, sorry, um, who try to discredit it or degrade it by saying, oh, it's just astrology. Oh, they're just, oh, they're just myths and legends. They're just stories. It's just astrology. And that's a way of, of playing it down. That's a way of degrading it. It's a way of dismissing it. And you can get into the argument of whether it classifies as astrology or astronomy. Um, it certainly isn't in the Western sense of astrology. Um, sort of European ideas of astrology, and I don't see much connection between Vedic either. But, you know, it's good to have the, these conversations, but this animosity between the disciplines does still exist, um, for better or for worse, and it's very difficult how we even address some of these questions. It depends on who's asking it, um, sometimes how we address it, because there's been plenty of times you've had uh, sort of racist right wingers come in to sort of dismiss it as astrology. I'm, you know, sitting there on social media arguing back and forth with them. And I've seen some books that talk about Aboriginal astrology. Um, I don't know much about that. I have noticed some of them are written by non Indigenous people, which makes me extremely suspect. I don't know the stuff behind that, but I also know there are Aboriginal people. You know, there's not a homogenous community. Like, there are people who bring in stuff from outside areas. And I'm sure there have been Aboriginal people who've tried to marry Western concepts of astrology with, with traditional knowledge. You know, that's that's not my area to get into that or say anything about that. But I'm sure I know that does happen. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, again, a very contested space in that in that regard. Thanks, Dwayne. That was a... Uh, um Nicely nuanced um, response. Um, it's another one. I'm, if this has been covered. I apologize. I'm mm. going back and forth between all the the questions. Um, uh, is there some explanation for the coincidence between the interpretations of the ancient Greeks and the Torres Strait Islander people? That's a very good question. If you don't mind me, mind me grabbing that, and Jess, I can throw it back to you if you like. Um, that's something we're actually doing a major research project. We're just starting right now. So at the University of Melbourne, we've got a collaboration between the School of Psychology and myself in physics and the different communities we're working with. And what we're trying to figure out is why there are so bloody many remarkable similarities between stars and groups of stars and their interpretations by different cultures around the world. This is something that you find, you know, the idea of the stars of Orion and the Pleiades chasing each other, Orion being a man, the Pleiades being a group of women, and the stars in the middle, the Hyades, preventing them from doing that, uh, the Gemini twins, or Altair being an eagle, you know, that's um, uh, often seen as Bungel in some communities in Kulin nations. You find these remarkable similarities. So what we're trying to look at is one of the ideas that it relates to human perception. So we're doing these perception studies that we're going to turn into a citizen science project. And so my colleagues, um, uh, Charles Kemp, Daniel Little, Simon Cropper in the School of Psychology and a brand new PhD student came in, Bridget Kelly. We're all working on this project now. We got some funding for that um, to get it kickstarted. Um, and we're going to try to, to do some experiments where we actually get you, the public, to go online um, with some randomly generated constellations and see what kinds of patterns you can make out of that. And then we're going to try to do a simulation where we're going to put people in a planetarium, simulate what the stars look like from a distant planet orbiting a different star, 
and get large data sets where people make up their own constellations, their own stories. And then we can start to put that data together and see what kinds of similarities we have. So it's, it's a huge project we're gonna be getting involved in, but it's meant to address that very question. Sounds really interesting. Um, thanks, Dwayne. Um, the next question is, I feel like it's a pretty big question, um, but you might be able to give a bit of a teaser. Um, so did different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have different constellations from others and what were the myths and beliefs about them? So Jess, do you, do you want to be here for another three months? <laughs> <laughs> this will be the last one, I promise. <laughs> this is going to have to be the last one, I think. But that's <laughs> Jess, do you want to have a go? Um, I'm happy for you to actually take this one first because I think I am, it's pretty similar to the question I answered um, a few minutes ago about some, uh, the relation between the cosmos and some um, stories with the guards. So I think I've, I've probably talked a bit too much on the, about that, but I'm happy for you to like take this and um, talk about a few other examples. Yeah, of course. There, every the thing that everybody has to know, the thing that I've been taught, the thing the elders have been teaching forever, every single star you can see in the sky, every cluster, every nebula, every mighty galaxy, every shooting star, everything you can see has significance, it has a name, it has a meaning, it has a purpose. It has a cultural purpose, it has a scientific purpose in that regard. I mean, those two can't be separated, of course, but everything has significance. And different communities see things in different ways. Some communities don't do many connect the dots constellations. Some do quite a few. Um, you're going to find some remarkable similarities between some of these groups of stars. You know, the Southern Cross, for example, you know, there are communities in northern Queensland and South Australia on the ocean who see it as a stingray. You're going to see communities who see it as an emu footprint or an eagle's footprint. You see communities in the southeast um, who often see it as a tree, like a yarn tree falling over a river, um, and the river being the Milky Way. You're going to see communities where it's not a constellation, but each individual star represents a character in a narrative. And these narratives um, are meant to combine all the different knowledge in a way we can remember. We're not going to memorize boring lists of facts. We want to create some fun stories about them, some interesting stories about them. That's where these oral traditions come from. That's where these so-called myths come from. They're not myths, they're knowledge systems being passed down. And the stories, the songs, the dances, those are just multiple ways of reiterating that knowledge in different ways. So, you know, one of the famous examples is the emu in the sky. We see that all across Australia. It goes by different names, and sometimes the shape of the emu might be a bit different. There's different parts of the sky that link to. But you're also going to see that in South America, the Raya in the sky with the Quechua people, for example, Mokoi people. You're going to see similarities all around the world in some of these uh, different traditions. So you're going to find similarities, you're going to find differences. But the one thing to remember, every single thing you can see in the sky has a name, it has significance, and it has meaning. Thank you for answering that very big question um, so succinctly. but. Um, I think it was uh, a nice, nice way to uh, approach that meaty question. Um, thank you both for um, all of your time and for, uh, for staying back and answering our questions. Um, there was a general one that came through. A few people want to know if they can um, access your slides. Um, so you can answer that later, but I will let everyone know that we have recorded this um, session and we will be publishing it on our website next week. Um, so you'll be able to see the video and hear the audio from that. Um, we've posted a bunch of links um, in, the, in the chat and also um, references to some books, um, some of which are in our collection. So please um, look those up. Thanks again um, to Jesse and Duane for, for sharing all of your wonderful knowledge. And thanks to my colleagues, Sharon and Kirsty, for helping out um, this evening. So I hope um, you've all had a great time and thank you for posting all your positive, lovely comments in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, please get in, in touch with us. Um, and I hope you all stay safe and well during this time. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.